Hello, everyone. <laughs> The program tonight should be very interesting. I spent some time this summer up in Concord looking at pauper records. Um, we were trying to track down a few more of Exeter's African-American population and their considerable number of people, unfortunately, get listed in the pauper records. And one of the most useful pieces of information we got from that was a lot of uh, that when, when entering into the uh, Rockingham County poor farm, which is where we had it here, uh, they had to give a deposition and state who they were and who their parents were and whether or not they had any kind of means to support themselves or any family who could support them. And what this meant for us from a genealogical point of view was that we would have people whose heritage we couldn't figure out and they would list off their parents' names and tell where they had been born and where their parents had been born. So it was tremendously helpful from our point of view, although it was a bit heartbreaking to keep finding people who's, who we only knew by their name um, and to find them uh, having to resort to the poor farm was, was tragic at times. Um, but it, it was helpful that these records were kept. So I did spend a lot of time with Papa Records this summer with, with one of our interns, Ben Weiss. Mm. It's more interesting than I thought. <laughs> you said that was in Concord? Yes, that was at the State Archives up in Concord. It's a lot of information you can get up there, particularly if you're looking for genealogical information, but there's a lot of court records up there as well. Uh, we, hadn't, we just hadn't dipped into most of these before, so it was great to see it to use it as a resource to find out more and more about Exeter's story, which is our goal always, <laughs> find out more about Exeter. <laughs> always. Okay, we've got people coming in now. Welcome everybody. Hopefully Facebook will stay up tonight for people who are watching on Facebook. <laughs> How did that affect you yesterday, Laura? Did it really, I mean, did it just choke all of your communications for the day or were you able to weather the horrible Facebook break? Well, I was unable to wish someone a happy birthday. Oh, for, for six whole hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and since it was in the middle of the work day and I just checked it at lunch, I had no idea that Facebook was out of commission. Other than that momentary frustration. <laughs> I think I checked the news or something at, at lunchtime and it was like Facebook's down. And of course I immediately went, what? And I checked Facebook to see if it was true. It's, it's like when you, when you get the, um, the, the laundry detergent with no scent, you know, and the first thing you do is sniff it. You, know, you have to find out if it really is. So I had to find out if it was. <laughs> And I think that I may have actually checked Facebook more yesterday afternoon to find out if it was back again than I would ordinarily have checked Facebook if it was just on, just because I wanted to see where it was. So very distracting. It's very distracting when Facebook goes down. I was amused that a lot of people were looking at Twitter to see what the status <laughs> of Facebook was. Uh, boy, we get too dependent on these things. Okay, we are almost ready to start. I think we're going to give it one more minute. My paper's making noise. No. Welcome to the Exeter Historical Society's October virtual program. I'm Barbara Rimkunis, the curator and co-executive director of the Historical Society. This program takes place at Meskwamskuk, now called Exeter, in Dadakana, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the Alnabak, the people, 
who have stewarded Nidakana and Itzaki, Nibi, Balakawak, and Awasak, the land, the waterways, the flora, and the fauna throughout the generations. I'd like to thank Exeter TV for bringing this program to you through Zoom. The program is also being presented on our Facebook page and on Channel 98. Tonight's program is sponsored by the New Hampshire Humanities Council. At the end of the program, you'll be rerouted, rerouted to a quick survey. This is the second program of our official season. On Tuesday, November 2nd at 7 p.m., we'll be back with Merrick Bennett to learn all about comics throughout history and what they say about the people and periods that created them. This program is also sponsored by New Hampshire Humanities Council. You can view our scheduled programs on our website and Facebook page. As for tonight, thank you for joining us for our presentation about Poor Houses and Town Farms by Stephen Taylor. Tonight, Steve will be answering questions at the end of the program. Laura Martin, our program manager and executive co-executive director, will be monitoring the Q&A dialog box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type your questions there. If you're listening on Facebook, you can write your questions in the comments and we'll try to get those out as well. If you're interested in learning more about Exeter's history, visit our website, exeterhistory.org. And if you're a member of the society, we thank you. Steve Taylor is an independent scholar, farmer, journalist, and longtime public official. With his sons, Taylor operates a dairy, maple syrup, and cheesemaking enterprise in Meriden Village. He's been a newspaper reporter and editor and served for 25 years as New Hampshire's Commissioner of Agriculture. Taylor was the founding executive director of the New Hampshire Humanities Council and is a lifelong student of the state's rural culture. Thank you, Steve for coming this night, tonight, the screen is yours. <laughs> well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to, come, to ex uh, come to Exeter electronically, uh, and uh, my greetings to all of you who are, are tuned in, and uh, I uh, uh, am very fond of Exeter in my uh, early uh, career. I uh, worked for the Portsmouth Herald, and frequently was assigned to do stories about goings on in Exeter. And so I've always had a soft spot in my heart for that lovely town. I have numerous uh, relatives who attended uh, Phillips Exeter Academy. And so I have deep uh, roots there, I guess. Uh, anyway, my talk tonight is about poor houses uh, and town farms. Uh, what's a dark chapter in New Hampshire history? It is a dark chapter in New England history. Uh, this idea of aggregating the poor and placing them on a farm uh, was called the New England method at its, uh, in its heyday. And it turned out to be a rather uh, uh, sad uh, um, initiative uh, that uh, uh, eventually was kicked up to the counties and the counties would struggle uh, with all of the issues that the town farms had uh, for uh, more than a century. Uh, anyway, uh, but in, in discussing this, this whole topic, I, I try to emphasize that there are some common themes uh, in uh, the, the difficulty of, of addressing the problems of uh, managing the poor in our midst. And these themes really trace back to medieval Europe. Uh, they're nothing new. I mean, they're not even modern issues. They're issues that have been around for centuries and centuries. Um, uh, going back to England, let's say, in 1349, an English law was passed which prohibited giving alms, in other words, assistance, to able-bodied poor. Now, right off the bat, that's a theme we're going to see over and over and over down through the years, a differentiation, trying to separate out those who are able-bodied and those who are helpless uh, and uh, give assistance to the helpless, but uh, force or require the uh, able-bodied to work. And uh, that uh, recurs over and over and over. Uh, in uh, 1496, the uh, parliament in England said, every beggar unable to work shall resort to where he last dwelled or was born. 
with penalty, if not, of three days in the stocks with bread and water, and then be turned out of town. Now, there's another theme, settlement. Uh, and what the, the, the implication of settlement is trying to avoid the burden, to ship the cost, to get somebody else to pay the expense. And that will recur over and over and over, way into our times today. Up to 1600, uh, in England, the, the bulk of assistance to the poor was provided by the churches, uh, unlike on continental Europe, where the to uh, be the primary beginning with the reign of Elizabeth I, uh, England would uh, enact a series of imposed maintenance of the poor. Came to be called the and the helpless and haven't really taken a run at different uh, it also uh, and vagrants and those severely punished, if you can imagine. Uh, subsequent laws would come innocent, sick, and diseased from those lusty, strong of limb, strong enough to labor. So there we are. We're pursuing that differentiation. It was a, uh, agreed as a society that the former, the poor, innocent, sick, and diseased should be cared for, and those who could work should be put to work uh, to support themselves. Well, uh, in coming to the New World, in Portsmouth in 1657, adopted an ordinance providing that any person taking in a border would hold the town harmless for their support. It soon became apparent and necessary for the town to provide uh, basic provisions and medical support for the poor. I can imagine what medical support might have been like. Uh, by 1690, the list of uh, people uh, who were needing assistance was growing rapidly and provoking intense debate in the then town of Portsmouth. Finally, in 1711, the town vote, voted to build an almshouse, a poorhouse. And uh, there's some evidence that that may have been one of the very first uh, poorhouses to be uh, uh, established in North America, in the New World. Uh, this uh, almshouse is to be overseen by the selectmen. And um, so here we are, we're aggregating the poor. We're putting them in one place. And now that's a theme that recurs down through the years. Um, provincial law the, uh, uh, enacted really by the, 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 the colonial governor, uh, it required suppression of common beggars and required setting the poor to work. And it established this, in the colony of New Hampshire the first statewide tax, which was dedicated for the support of the poor. Uh, the uh, early statutes also said idlers, loiterers, and disorderly people uh, to be subject to hard labor. Uh, again, uh, a work requirement here, and we find that that's a, uh, a variation on the differentiation theme uh, to com uh, compelling uh, labor. Um, the uh, uh, 
uh, state of New Hampshire is uh, the population is growing in the 1700s. Land is being cleared. Settlement is moving westward and northward from the seacoast. And uh, the uh, most prevalent method of managing the poor comes to be a practice called boarding out uh, or where people were bound out. And what it would basically be was an auction of human beings. At town meeting, uh, a, the moderator would call for bids. Who will care for this elderly, infirm woman for the least amount of money? This is an auction. Uh, or perhaps uh, there's a young man of limited mental capacity, but he's strong, he can work. Who will take this man and put him on their farm and have him work? How much will they pay the town for his labor? And children, orphans, of which there were many at the time, uh, were not auctioned off in this, this uh, horrible practice. They were simply placed by the selectmen uh, with families in uh, what were called uh, uh, apprenticeships. Uh, usually a binding of the child to the host family until the age of 21, during which time the hosts were presumably going to teach that child a, a trade. So this was a pretty grim uh, prospect for, for at that time. And it lasted, and it was the rule for managing the poor until about 1815, when uh, there was revulsion about what was being done, especially coming from the pulpits, uh, to stop this practice and to try to figure out a more humane uh, and kind approach. Well, while this is, is playing, uh, uh, New Hampshire becomes uh, convulsed by domicile issues. Uh, in other words, how to force somebody else to pay for the cost of supporting the poor, whether they're auctioned off or whatever, that somebody else is going to be found, if we can, and make and they're going to be made to pay. And so between towns, there was endless litigation, what were called settlement suits. And there is some lore that more money was spent on litigating settlement than was spent on actually supporting the poor people. Uh, another uh, uh, horrible practice was called warning out. Uh, if a uh, selectman heard of uh, a poor woman with two little children coming into town, they would might go over to the, the residence or wherever she had landed and uh, serve a writ which said, you have three days to get out of town. It didn't provide any clue as to where that poor woman and her children might go. It was just a penalty for the owner of the building and for the poor woman, the humiliation is she to be warned out of town. And uh, this was quite common. It was common all over New England. I read fascinating accounts in Vermont and, uh, and Maine about uh, this practice uh, being carried out there as well. As I said, orphans apprenticed indentured basically until the age of 21. Um, the, uh, uh, some of these uh, situations approach the ridiculous. In, in my little town in the Connecticut Valley, Plainfield, in 1814, uh, the town grew weary of caring for three families in a neighborhood called Meriden. And uh, they came up with an inspiration. They said, let's buy them a farm, settle them on the farm, tell them to raise their own food and care for themselves, cut their own wood and all, and uh, get the burden off the town taxpayer. Um, 
So they uh, hunted around for a suitable farm. And my goodness, if they didn't select one, 110 miles to the north in Columbia, up near the Canadian border. And so they shipped these families up there. And those people settled in a neighborhood up there on this farm. And it was not long before the selectmen of Columbia were in touch with the Plainfield selectmen saying, see here, we have some of your people and under the settlement law, you've got to pay for their support. We're laying out money to care for them. And so the Plainfield selectmen uh, reluctantly paid up, but soon those people migrated back to uh, Plainfield, the Meriden neighborhood. And uh, the, the uh, legacy of that thing is very interesting. In Columbia, there is a, a hill called Meriden Hill. And the folks in Columbia had no idea where that came from until I went up there and was doing some research and explained how Plainfield had tried to foist these poor people uh, and their, the burden of caring for them on them, and uh, they were somewhat amazed. Well, 1821, Governor Levi Woodbury, who was a very uh, a towering figure in, in New Hampshire affairs in the first half of the 19th century, he was a jurist, he was a, a, a good politician, uh, and he served uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, he, uh, he, from all we can gather about him, he was a, a fairly progressive, uh, visionary person. And he was very concerned. He had grown increasingly concerned uh, during his tenure as governor over the rising cost of uh, supporting the poor. So he, he came up with a, an idea for some legislation to try to change the whole approach. Um, he, uh, uh, at the outset, said he was very reluctant to harm the innocents. And by that, he he meant primarily widowed mothers with children or women whose husbands had absconded. And that was a very common problem in those times. Uh, they had none of the uh, infrastructure we have today to chase down deadbeat dads. Uh, but uh, he was worried about harming them with a radical new approach. Uh, but... Uh, he was very emphatic about needing to cut off those reduced to want by indolence or extravagance or from the haunts of intemperance. Uh, he also proposed uh, um, consolidating uh, locations where people would be lodged. In other words, getting away from board, around, board out, uh, bound out, and, uh, and, and, and have them uh, come uh, and be placed in a, in a central location. And he advocated repeal of the settlement laws, which would say wherever the person is, is, the, is responsible for that person. You can't try to ship the cost off somewhere else based on where they may have come from or where they were born. Well, um, his idea, his proposal, uh, his legislation went nowhere. And uh, he, uh, he threw in the towel on it. He said, obviously, it's too radical a change, change that's unlikely to occur politically. And uh, he, uh, he, sh he decided no incremental approach uh, was worth uh, trying. So uh, that was the end of the idea for the time being. But it, it would gestate. In other words, it would kind of lurk around in, 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 the, in the public policy realm for a while uh, until 1828, when the legislature kind of took his idea and passed legislation, which authorized towns to buy farms for the purpose of caring for lodging the poor. And uh, that idea took on, and it spread like wildfire in a matter of four or five years. 
uh, town after town after town was buying a farm and immediately began boasting about the great savings that this arrangement uh, uh, brought uh, to the town budget. Uh, the town of Claremont bought a farm for $3,500 in the following year, and it's an, in the annual report said um, that the cost of supporting the poor had dropped from $800 to $48. And uh, many other towns were reporting and bragging about similar great savings um, and uh, boasting about how, uh, uh, you know, how effective this, uh, this whole idea was. Portsmouth uh, decided to end its almshouse in the compact area of the city, then city and uh, bought a farm uh, out where um, Woodbury Avenue is there, out where all those great big shopping centers are now and set up a, 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 a town farm uh, for its poor people. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, data is kind of hard to, uh, to verify, but it is believed as many as 75% of New Hampshire towns would come to purchase a, a farm and establish a town farm a poor farm, and so that term becomes part of the of the New Hampshire vocabulary: town farm or poor farm, used in interchangeably. Uh, and uh, and so uh, uh, um, um, everywhere I go in New Hampshire, I find towns they have a town farm road or old town farm uh, 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 highway or whatever. Uh, these farms, were, uh, as, they, as they got rolling, uh, quite interesting, but they're very similar wherever you were. They uh, uh, produce substantial portion of the food <clears throat> and uh, uh, for the residents and uh, also uh, brought in some money from cash sales of produce of the farm. Uh, a typical farm in those times would have uh, a team of horses and multiple teams of oxen. Um, and people are always intrigued by that. Why don't they have more horses? Well, oxen were preferred uh, certainly in the first two and a half centuries of life in New Hampshire. Um, they're slower, but they're uh, more reliable. They're less flighty, uh, less uh, difficult to train and so on. And then of course, another uh, important aspect of that is that we don't have a, and then they didn't have a tradition of eating horse meat. And so they don't want to, a, a horse comes to the end of the line, nobody wants to eat it. But an ox comes to the end of the line, it's slaughtered and becomes a beef and people are fine with that. They had cows. And the cows, of course, are a marvelous machine. They produce storable protein and uh, fat for the human diet. Uh, in, the, in the form of cheese and butter. Uh, they produce, uh, uh, when slaughtered, they produce meat that can be smoked and cured. Uh, they produce uh, hides that uh, are man uh, processed into leather. Uh, the cow produces offspring. If it's a male, it can be raised and made into an ox. If it's a female, it is, uh, becomes part of the, uh, of the production system. And they also produce a marvelous product every day. It's called manure, which when added to the uh, granitic New Hampshire soil helps uh, foster growth of crops. Uh, they uh, usually had some sheep to produce wool. They had uh, uh, hands in the, in the house that could, uh, could uh, card and, and spin and and we've uh, crude textiles. That's the term homespun. Uh, so that wool was put to good use. They always had hogs. Hogs are great converters of uh, surplus uh, commodity like vegetables that can't be uh, uh, beyond what the, the family, the, the families need, the people need. Hogs are, uh, are uh, uh, 
born usually in the spring and raised all summer and then slaughtered in the fall. Much of their meat can be cured and stored for, uh, for the human diet over a period of the, the long cold winter and into the spring. Well, they say about the hog is when a hog is killed, they use everything but the squeal. Uh, because uh, if you don't believe me, uh, it's not much popular in New Head cheese is a big deal. So the hog is a versatile critter. Head hens to produce eggs. Uh, stew or whatever. Um, they always had uh, and bragged about their inventories of commodity, uh, potatoes particularly. And some of the ledgers that I have read are astonishing. Uh, they might say at the end of December in storage, they had 100 bushels of potatoes. Uh, I know what it's like to grow potatoes and a lot of pests. Weeds are a big problem. To keep the, uh, the potatoes growing and thriving is a big, big uh, uh, mess of labor and hard work. Uh, but they did it, and uh, they had uh, uh, large inventories of cider, which basically was hard cider. And hard cider was safe to drink, probably in many cases safer to drink than the water they had on the farm. They had no understanding of bacteriology then, but they knew you could drink cider as a beverage and you didn't get the uh, stomach complaints and intestinal bugs that uh, could come from drinking water. And so they, they, they thought nothing of giving hard cider to children as a beverage. Uh, of course, they had inventories of lard from those pigs uh, for shortening. Uh, they had to have some vinegar, salt pork, cheese, various grains, et cetera, et cetera, all inventoried at the end of the year and reported in the earliest uh, uh, town reports. And then they would have large inventories or large stacks of firewood because that was the wood was the primary means of heat in those times. And uh, if you had labor available on the farm, uh, and there were, all the farm tasks were caught up and you put them to work in the woods, uh, cutting down and, and um, cutting up uh, uh, trees for firewood. And firewood uh, is as good as cash in that economy. Uh, um, they could sell it for cash money, a ready market, always available. Able-bodied were put to work. And... Uh, uh, in, in the house, uh, if uh, people might be, uh, you had infirm people who could not uh, fend for themselves, others might be there who could uh, take care of uh, the people uh, confined to the, to the town farm house. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> in some instances, they had more labor than the town really, uh, the town farm really needed. And uh, an example was I found in Hanover, uh, they hired out several of the men who were part of the town farm uh, to work on a sawmill nearby. And uh, the wages that those men earned working on the, on, at the sawmill, uh, handling lumber, stacking lumber, and all that kind of thing, uh, those wages went to the town. They didn't go to the men. So that was uh, uh, one aspect of that. Um, bear in mind that if you, if you had to go to the town farm, you, had, uh, you were in dire straits, so uh, you had no resources other than your clothing, you still you had to give over everything you owned, including your clothing, right down to your undergarments and your stockings. Now bear in mind that not only were the poor in these uh, facilities, uh, they are also used to uh, ha uh, house uh, elderly, the insane people. Uh, was, a number of, of the town farms had cells or secure rooms where uh, insane people were confined. 
and it was not unusual to, for petty criminals to be sentenced to the to the town farm and put to work uh, uh, and so on. Of course, orphans, if they didn't have a family to care for them, they could be sent to the uh, to the town farm. Now, it's very interesting to read uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the reports of uh, uh, spending by the town on maintenance of 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 the of the town farm. Found a wonderful one from Orphan from 1850. Uh, they uh, uh, did uh, they, uh, they couldn't raise everything on the farm. They had to buy in some commodities. Uh, uh, in, in Orphan 1850, uh, they purchased 42 gallons of molasses, 50 pounds of coffee, 20 pounds of tea, 100 pounds of salt codfish, and 150 pounds of sugar. That's what it took to get through the year. Um, but it was not all drudgery. They bought a pound and a quarter of snuff, a pound and three quarters of yellow snuff. I don't know what the distinction is there, but uh, and um, four pounds of LL snuff. And don't ask me what LL stands for, but they obviously they bought a lot of snuff. And they bought 45 pounds of tobacco, and they had purchased 24 pipes. Um, clothing, uh, from time to time, they would buy a tweed coat, uh, a buffalo robe, and uh, they bought mouse traps and strychnine to carry, uh, to, care, uh, to battle against the vermin, and they bought a bottle of bed bug poison. Uh, and drugs, uh, my gosh, we hear about drugs today. Uh, you should read what they hear, what they did in then uh, to, to uh, take care of the needs of the uh, orphaned uh, poor. Uh, Ten ounces of laudanum, which, as I understand, is a is a, a, a opioid, and uh, and then a, a, a four pounds of opium. My goodness. Uh, and so on. Patent medicines, unbelievable volumes of patent medicines. Bain, Jane's expectorant, Davis's painkiller. Uh, I bet that had. I bet that was basically an alcohol. Uh, two boxes of Ayers pills, two bottles of Muffet's bitters, Peruvian syrup, and Weeks compound. I mean, good lord. Um, they have lots of ways to. Uh, I guess, uh, opiate the people or whatever you call them. Well, anyway, uh, in Portsmouth, very interesting, I came across a monograph uh, uh, from 1835. Uh, it was written by Reverend Dr. Charles Burroughs. He was the rector of St. John's Church in Portsmouth. The church is still stands. Uh, he, uh, uh, he obviously was, had been hearing about this wonderful town farm they had out on Woodbury Avenue, and he went out and took a look around, and he came back and, and, and wrote uh, an interesting piece. Uh, he said, uh, uh, it's necessary to distinguish when you're talking about uh, these people, you need to distinguish between poverty and pauperism. Uh, we use those terms interchangeably, uh, in our vocabulary today, but he said, poverty results from misfortunes, not faults, and poverty deserves our kindest commiseration. Pauperism, he said, results from willful error or vicious habits, and it's a misery of human condition. He said, relief to the poor is charity, but relief of pauperism, though in many cases unavoidable, and where refused would be apparently inhumane, seems to generate evil in a tenfold degree. And uh, he said, in seeking the best method of supporting the poor, let it never be supposed that it is safe, wise, Christian, or humane to do nothing. So that was how Reverend Dr. Burroughs saw this whole matter. Well, 
1850s roll in and uh, there is a growing disillusionment with this, this great experiment. Uh, there were a number of issues that were bubbling to the surface. First of all, a lot of the uh, savings that were uh, claimed early on were evaporating and it was costing more than they expected, particularly maintenance of the buildings and that kind of thing. Uh, and so uh, people said, well, I thought we were going to save a lot of money, but uh, we're not. And it's beginning to cost us money to have a poor farm. Um, uh, there were bad conditions on these farms. You were aggregating people at a time when there were no uh, vaccines like we have today to stop the common diseases like diphtheria, measles, mumps, uh, scarlet fever, uh, on and on. Uh, you aggregated people in one place, and they could they they could be they had no uh, defense uh, from from vaccination. Um, and then, of course, with the, the two terrible scourges of the 19th century uh, that we uh, we fortunately have largely eradicated. Number one, they called it consumption. Today, uh, we call it tuberculosis. And uh, uh, they, an awful lot of people died of tuberculosis because of the way they tried to manage uh, consumption. Uh, they thought when a person was showing symptoms uh, and, and uh, they were around others in the, in, in the facility, they should all be put in a warm room, which is the worst place because the pathogen that causes uh, tuberculosis is readily aerosol. And then the other one was undulant fever, which we don't hear about now. It's been eradicated. It comes from drinking raw milk from diseased cows. And uh, it is like polio. It's a skeletal neuro disease. If it doesn't kill you, it leaves you uh, crippled. And uh, so they had that constantly at the forefront. So these facilities often were akin and in some instances, we call pest houses. And um, uh, they became dread places. And if you were placed there, uh, it was the absolute worst thing that could happen to you in the view of many people. And so that, that tended to discourage people from even considering or doing whatever they could to avoid being stuck there. So anyway, and then there was a very interesting aspect in the 1850s as well, was the rise of the abolitionist movement. And from the pulpits, uh, uh, preachers began to say, this system we have for managing our poor people called the town farm or the poor farm is inhumane and immoral. And uh, they could say, the slave owner in South Carolina asks, why in New Hampshire, you are confining people, you know, uh, you're confining them and forcing them to work uh, uh, on these farms. How is that different from our slave system in the South? And so that, that was a very potent message uh, that was being carried from the pulpits. Well, the coming of the Civil War, uh, the the whole discussion got pushed on the back burner. Uh, nobody talked much about reforming or doing something about the uh, some of the horrors or some of the problems with the, the town farm. Uh, but at the end of the Civil War, there was a great concern that uh, town farms, poor farms, were going to be overwhelmed with large numbers of orphans and uh, and mothers whose husband had been killed in the war. Uh, and uh, it didn't pan out that way because both the New Hampshire legislature and the federal government uh, came forward with uh, pension systems for uh, survivors uh, of uh, war veterans. Uh, so by 1868, uh, uh, towns almost wholesale across New Hampshire in a matter of three years time, exited the town farm experiment 
they gave it up. They said, we're not doing it. We're out. We're not going to do this anymore. Well, what happened to all those people? They sent them to the county. They told the county, you guys take them over and you care for them, county. And so you saw in all 10 counties, establishment of the same system, an agricultural enterprise attached to an aggregating facility, uh, a farm with uh, lodging and, and uh, facilities for housing uh, the poor people. And it was everywhere, all 10 counties uh, established these farms. And uh, they uh, would very, uh, very, very soon all have many of the same problems that the, the towns were running away from. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was years, it was a, the better part of a century, uh, counties wrestling with these problems. Um, uh, in Rockingham County, it's very interesting. The the county delegation uh, in 1875 wrangled and fought over how to how to uh, manage this sudden surge of responsibility of caring for all these people the towns were sending to them. Uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, a time when they eventually they settled on. A, a, a uh, what became what they called a, a home, a county home, which we still have today in, in all the counties in, in Rockingham as, uh, among them. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, idea of a separate facility to be a jail and so on. But uh, it, was, it was costly and uh, um, uh, uh, fraught with all kinds of politics. And uh, uh, in Stratford County, they had a horrible episode in the 1880s. They built a great big wooden thing, sort of like a dormitory, and there was a horrible fire, and more than 80 people died uh, in that fire. Uh, all the counties wrestled with this, and they continued to wrestle with it, on and on and on, uh, a grim, uh, grim uh, situation. In 1922, the Loyal Order of the Moose. I don't know if you have any moose lodges left in the seacoast, uh, but uh, they were like the Elks. Uh, they're still around. They, there was a chapter in Claremont until a couple of years ago. Uh, they, uh, basically, they were a drinking club, but their, their uh, big cause as, as a fraternal order uh, beginning with their founding back in the 19th century, was always the welfare of children. And in 1922, the Loyal Order of the Moose funded a study in which they sent agents to every county um, institution in New England uh, to survey the conditions and draft reports that were consolidated into a massive uh, uh, binder. Um, uh, and, and they, the, the reports are, are so horrible, uh, amazing. I won't pick on Rockingham County tonight, so I'll, I'll pick on Hillsborough County. I'll read a little excerpt of the report that the Moose agent prepared about conditions at the Hillsborough County farm and county home and county jail all in Grasmere, their one great big complex. Uh, <laughs> they said, this is a combination of jail with 91 prisoners, a poor house with 280 inmates, an insane asylum with 11 inmates, a county hospital there uh, with 92 patients, maternity cases average 50 a year, 38 children are now there, ranging from infancy to nine years of age, some illegitimate, others orphans or deserted, most of them subnormal, some are bright looking, they receive no training, they are not even taught to play. Infected persons associate with other inmates. A woman with facial cancer sleeps in the woman's dormitory and eats with the other inmates. The clothes of infected inmates go into the regular watch. One of the wards of the poor farm building is, serves as a nursery for children. 
politics curse this institution. Superintendents usually hold the job but one term, two years, as good service does not mean continued service. Indifference is the rule. Uh, that's the Hillsborough County people, but uh, the others uh, uh, are pretty devastating as well. The worst one I read of all was in Rutland County, Vermont, where it was said that uh, reverend clergy declined to go uh, to administer sacraments, that conditions were so vile. Uh, so you get the picture. Well, the counties would, would struggle on and struggle on, and uh, the, 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 the whole matter of, of uh, uh, caring for the poor would vex. Towns still had responsibility to be the first line of uh, care uh, for the poor. Uh, but uh, uh, long term, the counties were, were compelled to, to, to carry the ball. Well, of course, the county's uh, tax base is the towns. Uh, in other words, every town and city in the state has to kick in, still does. they all do still. Uh, through the property tax uh, to support these county institutions. Well, here in modern times, uh, virtually all, uh, every one of the 10 counties except one has gotten out of the farming business. They still have their facilities, their homes, their jails, and so on at the, uh, uh, where, where, the where the county farm was established. But uh, only Grafton County has a real farm. And they milk 90 cows there, a great big uh, Victorian barn. And they raise pigs and they sell piglets to the general public. They raise prodigious amounts of squash, lots of zucchini, of course. And uh, those uh, the commodities and sweet corn and so on, those commodities uh, such as our uh, surplus to the needs of the, uh, of the, of the county home kitchen are uh, donated to uh, food pantries and food banks around the county. But uh, uh, I did a little research. I asked the National Association of Counties uh, if they could find how many counties in the United States have a working dairy farm. And they said there's only one that they could find, and that's Grafton County, New Hampshire, up in North Haverhill. Well, anyway, uh, I, uh, I want to uh, kind of uh, sum this up uh, in this manner. I, I, I ask you to think about that matter of differentiation, uh, the worthy poor versus the, the uh, who are helpless, poor but honest. Uh, I think society today, as they did back then, said, as certainly as Reverend uh, Burrow said, uh, society agrees we need to care for them. But the vagrant, vicious poor, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, the settlement business, really it wasn't until the 1970s that uh, a series of lawsuits against the state of New Hampshire and many different towns kind of changed that whole thing. Uh, the use of tax money uh, gets it down to who's going to pay and how can we avoid paying uh, where he last lived or was born. All of these things have been tried down through the years uh, to... Uh, to address this settlement matter. Uh, it, 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 uh, I, I tell about, when I, I was a town selectman way back in the late 60s, and I was the young guy on the board, and the old timers, they said they'll fix me. They made me the overseer of the poor, they called it then, and my job was to provide aid, uh, uh, the first line, uh, provider of aid when people present themselves. And uh, it might happen that I would uh, be sitting down with my family for supper on Saturday night and knock at the door. And there's a, a woman there and she might say, uh, 
my husband's boss didn't pay him today. We didn't get any pay. He's going to pay Monday, but I haven't got any food for the children. Can you help me? And so I'm duty bound there to give her what was called an order, basically a voucher, maybe 30 bucks to go to the store and get some beans and hot dogs and bread and so on and be able to feed those children. Or it might be a man who said, ah, I, I, I'm broke, I can't afford, uh, the, I live in a trailer park, in a trailer, and I'm out of heat, I haven't got any heat. Again, I'd be duty bound to give him an order uh, to go to Lebanon to get some kerosene to get his heater going again. Uh, there's 25 bucks, 30 bucks, who knows? Anyway, but on Monday morning, my, my duty is to find out where those people come from and might ask around and might find out that uh, hmm, they came from Enfield. Uh, so I call up. Uh, Mr. Blaine, the chairman of the selectmen over in Enfield, and said, Arthur, got some of your people over here. I had to give them a couple of orders. How about it? Uh, can you send me a check for 65 bucks? And he said, wait a minute. Who, what'd you say their name was? I'd say the names. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. They're from Canaan. You know, you just keep pushing that problem further and further away. I mean, it was, a, it was absurd, uh, but that's the way it played. And, and it was a uh, uh, just endless log rolling, and uh, uh, eventually uh, we we got it fairly well straightened out. But uh, it, it it's uh, it's not really totally resolved. Um, you know this problem of lodging the poor, housing them. We tried uh, aggregating them, boarding out all those kinds of things. Poor houses, town farms, county farms, homes. Well, look in modern times what we have, what we're dealing with, homeless shelters, um, uh, housing projects. Uh, not too many up in this part of the state where I live, but I know uh, there are many, uh, several communities where uh, uh, low-income housing uh, is, is, is provided, it's available. Um, we have uh, these nursing homes for the infirm, uh, Medicaid nursing homes. Uh, they're all struggling right now. We have county uh, nursing homes, of course, and um, they're, they're costly. Uh, but I visited most of them in the, in the state, and they, they give wonderful, uh, very good quality care uh, for the most part. And... Uh, uh, I would say we're, we're fortunate to have them as an alternative to some of these other nursing homes, which I don't think uh, measure up uh, in terms of, of care. And then, of course, we have prisons. In the United States, we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people confined in prison. And most of them are poor people. If you're rich and you have to go to prison, you'll go to a place like Allenwood in Pennsylvania, which they call a Playboy Club. But uh, uh, prisons are where an awful lot of poor people end up and are housed or warehoused in our culture. As to uh, compulsory labor, uh, you had those auctions and contracts, putting people out, hard labor for idlers, all of that town farms, work on a farm, um, we still require labor. You know, we, uh, we, we uh, if you need uh, unemployment compensation, lose your job, uh, you have to show that you're trying to get another job, that you're trying to find employment. I mean, it's a form of requiring uh, the needy to make an effort to work. Uh, in 1996, uh, uh, Clinton and Gingrich got together and passed what at the time was called the greatest welfare reform in the 20th century. And it was a, the, the basic component of it was welfare to work. So recipients of federally funded uh, uh, welfare uh, were compelled to get a job or get skills the uh, education or training that would enable them to get a job. 
and uh, if if they possibly if, if they, unless they are uh, you know disabled. Uh, what that did that 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 at the time called reform did was occasion a 50% decline in the numbers of people who were getting assistance under federally funded welfare programs. Uh, so it was pretty, pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, so I think I will conclude just by saying uh, we have for centuries and centuries endured deep conflict and ambivalence about how society should deal with the issues of poverty. And uh, I uh, will say in total confidence that my grandchildren's grandchildren will probably be facing some variation or some very similar issues uh, in their time. And so I've talked long enough and I see my time is just about up, but if there are questions, I'd love to, uh, to discuss. Uh, yes, Steve, we have a number of questions. Great. Um, I'll just dig in. Jackie says, not everyone is a farmer. Were there town or other overseers to manage these farms or were the poor left to figure it out on their own? Very commonly, uh, one of the selectmen would be designated as sort of the superintendent of the farm or a uh, neighboring farmer was to keep an eye on things. But uh, that gave rise to one of the other great problems of the, of the whole approach and that was corruption, an awful lot of uh, uh, skullduggery. Um, you know, just imagine if they got a hundred bushels of potatoes in the in the uh, root cellar. Um, you know, a shady selectman might go up on uh, uh, late in the afternoon, and suddenly there are a couple of bushels in the back of his buggy, and um, you know, he gets home, he doesn't know where they came, or they found them on the roadside, or whatever. You know, all that. It happened, and so that was a big problem: corruption and and uh, malfeasance. Certainly was, uh, yeah. but as as you say, there were people confined to these facilities who were not farmers. Uh, even today, uh, you find uh, at the Grafton County <laughs> facility they have a farm, and it's always been assumed that prisoners there would work on the farm. Well, the prisoners are. <laughs> not, they're not farmers, and they're not, they're they're bad for the cows. So it ends up they have to have civil service farmers caring for for the cows, and the and the the, the prisoners uh, remain in their cells. All right, we have a question from Kent. What are some important historic documents or resources that illustrate the New England method? in the 1600s or 1700s? Uh, there, is, there, there is a good body of literature. Um, uh, you, you know it's around. I, I have drawn mine, uh, a lot of my research is from old town reports and town records. Uh, and, and, but there, there, are, uh, there are reliable and well done academic studies uh, there is one called The Poor Farm. Now, off the, if I could run over to my uh, my bookshelf, I'll get you the name of the author. But um, I Google Google Poor Farm, and you will find uh, a body of literature. Yeah. Great. Um, David says, any reason to believe that differentiation had a racial dimension? Oh, most certainly, absolutely. Uh, and not just uh, black white uh, um, uh, in, uh, in the 19th century, there was the Protestant uh, Yankee versus uh, all these various uh, uh, other uh, uh, immigrant groups uh, um, uh, in Polish, uh, uh, German, Greek, Irish, oh my Lord, in the 1840s and 50s, uh, we have a large uh, population of Irish. Irish were regarded as drunks and, uh, and troublemakers. Um, and later on, um, they call them Frenchmen or Canucks. 
people who migrated here from Quebec uh, and uh, they were, and there definitely was, there is um, in the culture, uh, unfortunately, uh, kind of a kind of a thread in, in New Hampshire and everywhere in New England of, of that kind of bias and discrimination and uh, just bad behavior. Um, John asks, did the Massachusetts Puritans use this same method for their poor? They, they, they pioneered uh, uh, warning out. They loved doing that. And they paid a, a, a fee to the selectmen to go and serve these warrants. I mean, think about uh, witchcraft. I mean, <laughs> they, they, these people were brutal. Uh, they just say, well, not our problem. Send them over to the next town. You know, Exeter would say, hey, uh, this is a problem for Brentwood. We'll ship them over to Brentwood. Get them out of here. We don't care. We just want them off our hands. And, yeah, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, those people were tough. <laughs> well, they were, by any standard, there a lot of cruelty uh, involved in, in all of this. Absolutely. Inhumanity. Renee asks, where were people who lived in poor farms buried? Did they have cemeteries on site? Mm -hmm. Can you speak specifically to Exeter? I can't speak to Exeter specifically, but uh, they they were buried on the ground, and, and of course they didn't have any marker. They got no uh, uh, no no gravestone, um, uh, a, a death certificate, a death record, in, as maintained by the town, might might not even give you a clue where they were buried, but. Uh, and I don't think they even were got uh, a, 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 you know, a, any kind of religious service or any kind of memorial. Um, uh, they were always under pressure to, to uh, bury uh, the deceased as fast as they could because they did not uh, begin to uh, use embalming until uh, this time of the Civil War. Um, the, there are, uh, you can find with the county farms, um, uh, O'Carroll County is an interesting example, um, uh, as they buried paupers at the Carroll County farm uh, later in the 19th century and into the 20th century, they would just number the, the burial plot. And they did keep a record of the name and the town where the person came from. And uh, about four years ago, a group of people in Carroll County did the research and found more information so that now you can go to the Register of Deeds office and they have a, a great big uh, ledger with all the names in those little plots out there that had a number and tell you. I know Grafton County burial spot uh, there are all these little, uh, just little tiny markers, uh, and, and that was the same. It was, uh, uh, a, a, I'm sure it was uh, a hit or miss, I guess is the right term. Uh, just uh, if they could bury somebody on the pat out in the pasture at the farm, uh, they would probably do it. Uh, the ground was frozen. Uh, most towns had what they called a receiving tomb where they would uh, hold a body until the ground could be turned and uh, a body could be it could be buried. Um, it's, uh, uh, there was not much dignity involved. Mm. Um, David has a multi-part question. Mm. As I'm studying Hollis from 1805 to 1830. Mm -hmm. Are there sources I may have missed? I have the newspaper, uh, Milford Cabinet, and materials from the Hollis Historical Society, also County Registry of Deeds. Do you know whether there are town meeting records? And if so, where would they likely be? Well, I, I, I don't know about Hollis. Uh, I, I know a lot of towns have fairly complete records and in totally complete records. 
um, and if they've done a good job, they've moved them to microfilm. You should be able to access them. Your town clerk, I mean, those are public records. You should be able to get them. But the unfortunate thing is an awful lot of town records in New Hampshire were lost uh, because records tended to be kept at the town clerk's home. And the town clerk's home burned down. Uh, the, the, the records were lost in the fire. And so you'll have gaps in, in some towns. But I, if I were in Hollis, I'd start with my town clerk and, uh, and find out if they committed the, their records to, to, uh, to microfilm. Uh, and and, and it's, it's going to be a long, hard slog. But uh, it's, it's very interesting if the records exist. If there are no records, I, I have no solution, really. I've have, I'm very lucky I happen to live in a town where we have every scrap of paper uh, relative to the town government, going back to Benning Wentworth, uh, 1761, when he chartered the town. Uh, and they, these are marvelous records, and we've microfilmed them. And if you can, if you can stand it, you can crank through reel after reel after reel, and you find all that stuff. My biggest problem is you know, the, the, the script that they used, I have a hard time <laughs> deciphering. Uh, some people, it's easy, but uh, I have studied it. What are they saying here? Just the way the words are written. But, uh, don't give up, Hollis. Uh, they, they, start with a town clerk, go after it. Uh, take a hard run at it. I, I would. Mm. Great. Um, John asks, how did our predecessors, the Native Americans, manage orphans? Do you happen to know? Uh, I would have to defer to somebody who's a lot more competent, but uh, uh, the, the, the Native Americans suffered horrible, horrible uh, pro uh, treatment from the invading uh, settlers uh, uh, who regarded them as savages, and uh, I, I, you know, the saying that was abroad was the only good Indian is a dead Indian, and things like that. Uh, of course, the European settlers uh, cleaned out, uh, from all that I have read, as much as 80 or 90 percent of the Native American population with their diseases that they brought with them. Uh, these people who were indigenous had no, uh, you know, natural bio defense, and they, they were wiped out by things as, you know, uh, the common cold was devastating. And, of course, other things, typhus and, and, and diphtheria and those things just, 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 just wiped out uh, a substantial portion uh, I'm sorry, I just don't know enough about uh, the children. There were some uh, some Indians were, I guess, were made into slaves. Uh, that's another. Uh, that's a, a great lecture. That's another dark chapter in in uh, in New England, New Hampshire history. I'm sure. Mm. Certainly. Um, so Ed and Judy have uh, more of a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I sit on Exeter's budget committee. The town has a welfare budget that supports grants for rent, heat, clothing, some medications, et cetera, for needy residents. Mm -hmm. But the welfare officer still makes the distinction between the worthy poor, those facing unforeseen misfortune, mm -hmm. and those she sees who are actually able to work. Mm -hmm. She gently encourages them to seek a job. The town also gives over 100000 each year to social service agencies that contribute to fulfilling the same welfare mission for town residents. Mm -hmm. um, that, okay. That's wonderful. And, and I, I, I can't uh, let it go without a, 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 a you know, com commendation to the, the private sector, really, the social service people. It can be churches, it can be service clubs, all kinds of different entities 
in New Hampshire that really help, uh, really are major contributors to to caring for the poor, the the unfortunate. Um, you know, wonderful things happen every day. You know, I'm so amazed at these food banks that pop up. You know, people donate all these canned foods. Um, a number of the supermarkets in New Hampshire donate uh, commodities and, and those kinds of things are very, very important. And, and charity uh, towards the, the, the poor is pretty remarkable. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, if it, it suddenly went away, the burden on taxpayers would, would certainly uh, get a jolt. Um, Carolyn has both a, a comment and kind of a question. Some libraries have town reports, such as Wilma. Doesn't the state have some town records? The, the, the state is hit or miss. Uh, it's some, some, some towns have been diligent about forwarding in, you know, go back to the 19th century. Um, others, they just never did anything for the state. Uh, with the state. In other words, never sent stuff in. And so uh, you can't count on the state library or the state archives to, 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 to have the data you want, the information you want from every single town. And so it, they get you back to your town records and, and hope uh, and pray that your town records can help you and, and show the way. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of attitude back in the day. Uh, I still hear it once in a while. And, eh, what Con Concord doesn't know about us won't hurt us. Uh, it just kind of tucked away in the hills, and uh, uh, we 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 do our thing and uh, keep it keep it to home, as they say. Um, John has another question, and if you can't answer it, Barbara might might be able to. Mm -hmm. Who can tell us where the Exeter Town Farm was situated, and when did it operate? Mm -hmm. I'll defer to the local expert. I can actually answer that question. <laughs> the um, the town poor farm was located on Old Town Farm Road. <laughs> That's kind of a giveaway. It was there until 1869 when the Rockingham County took over the uh, town farm, and then it was moved out to Brentwood. Mm -hmm. And there are people buried out there for a re an earlier question about that. There, there are some burials out at the Old Town Farm Road Cemetery. Some of the town farms, uh, uh, the, the structures remain. I, they're still, they're, I, I've been to a couple of towns where they've shown me pictures of uh, residents and said, that used to be the town farm house. Oh, and, wow. uh, a lot of them weren't very good and they were taken down the, the timbers were salvaged or they burned down or whatever and uh, you know they've just rotted away yeah. yeah i don't think there's anything left in exeter just the name of the road old yeah. town farm road yep yeah, that's all it's interesting how uh the poor farm the the term the poor farm is a uh, is a very important part of new england vocabulary um well, I always think of my late wife. Uh, she'd take all the bills out of the drawer and spread them out, and we got to pay bills. And she'd mutter, "We're going to the poor farm." <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's 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 uh, that, you know, it's it's sort of just just to, you know, not slang. It's just casual conversation. Boy, uh, I'm going to poor farm with this oil bill. You know, uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Great. Mm. Sorry, we have two last comments, uh, both from Jen. I think this first comment was in the middle of your presentation. Uh, she wrote raw milk from diseased cows. Oh. Wow. That doesn't sound very good. <laughs> oh. And then um, back to the conversation about Medicaid um, must prove work for Medicaid supplement to Medicare. Um, I assume she means now. So, yeah, the, the, that that the raw milk situation. Uh, it took seventy-five years of politics uh, to get milk safe to drink. 
uh, in New Hampshire. There was a long, hard slog. I mean, it goes way back. A lot of people thought Louis Pasteur was a nut and they weren't going to do anything he suggested. But uh, it, it took a while. Gradually, uh, in, in, it, it became an expectation on the part of consumers that the milk would be pasteurized. Uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> Uh, in, 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 in classic New Hampshire fashion, uh, early on, they just punted it to, from the state level to the towns. And so some towns and cities would require milk to be pasteurized if sold within their boundaries. And others just, let's say fair, and take your chances. Uh, oh, my God, it was an awful battle. Um, you know, people just said, uh, something that I can't see with the naked eye can't make me sick. How could that be? Uh, you know, they just uh, refuse. And, uh, uh, but that, that onion fever and tuberculosis, tuberculosis is also uh, 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 transmitted by uh, raw milk. Uh, but those two diseases were, were eventually stamped out by eradicating carrier cattle. And whole herds would be condemned if there was one, what they called a reactor. One cow showed a positive blood titer for uh, undulant fever uh, pathogen or whatever. And, and then that finally paid off by about World War II. We, we got a status of New Hampshire being totally free of those bovine diseases that were, were, were so bad. But we had and made pasteurization the rule and that was a great uh, that was a great uh, public health triumph really as was making water safe to drink too okay. uh, municipal water systems and uh, awareness of having sanitary water supplies those were great public health breakthroughs in the 20th century yeah no, I forgot what the second half was. Yeah. <laughs> I went um, on long. Medicare and, and Medicaid and, and oh, yes, having yes. to work. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, just like they did back in the 1400s. You know, people need to work. That's right. Yes, they can. Well, thank you so much, Steve. And, and thank you to the New Hampshire Humanities. Yes, um, Thank and you for those, having me, and those were great comments and questions. And we would really appreciate it if um, the attendees would fill out the survey. You should be redirected to it as soon as this ends. So thank you, and um, we hope to see you next month. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night.